Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Ainsley. I'm with Exelon on the nuclear side in Kennett Square, uh, Pennsylvania. I was going to talk a little bit about uh, some of our IT OT convergence projects um, relative to nuclear. Um, I first want to tell you a little bit of background. Um, I got hired in Exelon about five years ago, and I w was in a reliability engineer, and I was working in corporate ER. And some of the tasks that I was re responsible for doing was uh, switching from time-based maintenance to condition-based maintenance. Uh, at the time, that's kind of a uh, impossible task. Um, but these pet projects were a side project while I was doing my every core duties. And uh, um, so it was very hard to move them along. Um, about two years ago, uh, Exelon realized the value of digital transformation. And so they pulled me and about 13 other people into a, 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 a digital plant innovation team where we decided to just go ahead and chop up all the pieces and try to work on it. And so the stuff that I ended up working on was uh, the Predix APM platform, uh, distributed antenna system, and the wireless sensors. I'm going to go ahead and talk about it a little bit. Okay, so for, for those of you who don't know, Exelon is a big utility located in the Northeast. They, uh, um, they have, there are basically two groups. One's on the transmission side, which is regulated, and that's, you know, the uh, Chicago, um, Pennsylvania, New York, Baltimore, DC area. And then I'm on the generation side, but basically it produces it. And they have three groups. It's nuclear, fossil, and uh, renewables. And again, I'm on the nuclear side. So let's kind of lay out of what they are. All right, quick 101 on nuclear. So, so, so basically you have, there's two different types of nuclear reactors, the PWRs and the BWRs. It's kind of the Westinghouse and GE type of thing. And there's 99, roughly 99 nationwide and Exelon has 23 of them. Um, the problems that I have with this stuff is that, you know, most of them were built in the 70s and 80s. And in fact, you know, um, Exelon owns the oldest, which is uh, Nine Mile Point. In 1969, it was commissioned. And um, so this got a lot of old technology that basically almost everything is uh, either pneumatic or analog, local display, and just really no DCS, no PC PLCs, none of that stuff. And uh, these sites are fairly big because they require a lot of data and a lot of rounds and such. And so, you know, roughly about 1,000 people work at these sites. So there's quite a bit of cost in people. Um, also, because of the design of them or so, that there is a lot of concrete and steel. And um, they're very difficult to, uh, to get cabling from one bay to the, the other. Um, and the last thing that makes it even more difficult is that while GE and Westinghouse are building these reactors, there's really no standard design. You can't really just cookie cutter through. Each site has its own little um, entity and they do their things, everything their own way. And lastly, um, nuclear is what they call base loading. So um, basically they come online, they run 100% and they run for 18 months to 24 months. They come down, refuel and they do it all over again. Um, the refueling time used to be around 45 days to 60 days. Exelon has done quite a bit of work to get it down to 21 days, which means that you can't do very much but other than put new fuel in it, do some mandatory PMs, get back up and get going again. So change is very hard when you're running at 100% all the time. And so we realized that the cost of natural gas was killing us. And... Um, if we didn't do something, you know, because a thousand people is a lot of people, and you know, a combined cycle plant, the same size, you know, we have a thousand, they'll have about 25 to 50. That's a huge difference, and the cost of natural gas was just killing us. So all the utilities that have nuclear got together and did nuclear promise. And nuclear promise is basically they were going to do some easy synergies between all the the groups to cut costs or so, and the goal was to do. Um, uh, a 30% cost reduction, which they pretty much done across the board. Exelon kind of decided we we're going to go a little bit farther, and we were going to try to do um, what they called 25 by 25, and that was to cut the cost of uh, you know, producing a mega, you know, uh, uh, producing power to 25 cents per, per megawatt, and uh, by year 2025. So that's one of the reasons why they started to uh, move along with digital transformation. So. The first and foremost, we uh, selected Predix a couple of years ago, probably like three or four years ago back when it was originally. Um, the reason why we did select it is because we did like the way the cloud security was and the fact that because we have a lot of regulations, we were required to go to what they call the AWS GovCloud, which is a very 
Uh, we care about where our data is. We care about who can see our data, and we compare it about how it's be basically being treated type of deal. Um, we really uh, treat security at the ultimate. ultimate. Um, no, one, we do, no one wants to hear that they've been breached, and especially nobody wants to know a nuclear site's been breached. So we really treat it pretty high, and we felt Predix had a good match on this. But, and also, we use them for uh, Smart Signal, which is a pattern recognition software. And we like Meridium, which also helps with the uh, condition-based monitoring type of deal. So it, it did a nice job. Plus, they all have the standard web or cloud-based stuff where the, you can do digital twin. You can you know, reduce your uptime and your plan maintenance and all that stuff. Uh-oh. Ah. Okay, so this is real pictures of real sites here. There's basically, we, it is all dials and analog and read only and that type of stuff. And so we go through the site and basically we pay lots of people to take readings as they go through. And so, you know, like again, those plants have been built for 30 years, manual analog, no, you know, no data network, limited power outlets, the whole nine yards on the whole thing and basically yeah. And the other thing, too, as I reminded you at the last note, is not only is it, you know, laborious to have people do it, but it's also, you know, radiation is in that area. And so we, we try very hard not to have people in that area. So it's, it's also a dose savings as well. Okay. So the gaps, the gallons, is basically we uh, decided to go ahead and do a huge investment um, in AOT software or IoT software, which is Predix. Um, basically, the way we're laid out is we have lots of inst instrumentation on a reactor side, but as you move towards the balance of plant, that instrumentation drops off drastically. We really care a lot about the reactor, but everything else, not so much. So and it was, we had a, you know, a lack of access to feed the data. You know, here we are talking about big data and cloud-based stuff, but if you don't have sensors and data to send to your, your, your Predix or your, your cloud platform, there's not a lot you can do. Um, we had no existing wireless and data networks. That's true and kind of untrue. Um, we, our data network's all throughout the whole site, and we can access to it if we chose to use traditional wiring. Um, but that process is long and laborious and requires shutdowns and outages, which is an ultimate no-no. And the cost has just got astronomical. And uh, so I developed a lot of wireless sensors technologies, but I didn't really pay too much attention about cybersecurity, and cyber kind of kicked me off. They were like, hey, you know, um, your, your security levels is not the same level as data, and also, you know, business network is our Wi-Fi, and so they kind of forced me into a hole and kicked me off the network, and so I really didn't have very much. Um, the traditional me methods of digitizing is way too expensive, and it just it takes too long. We, we need to turn around, and we need to run, and we need to run wide open. So, what we ended up coming up with is a system that's parallel and totally off the business and data network. Um, it's called the distributed antenna system. And uh, it's a newer technology that we got from EPRI and they kind of suggested this to us and we, tr we trialed it a couple, we did a proof of concept and we're doing a trial, our pilot at Nine Mile. It's a, north of, uh, a Nine Mile facility north of uh, Syracuse. And basically it's a wireless backbone. This is again, since we're around concrete, there's a lot of communications that we need to talk to everyone inside of it. And so what we ended up doing is combining all that stuff with lower frequencies, because lower frequencies go propagate a lot farther on a single backbone. And then that way we were able to keep the synergies in our cost low. We also developed what we call non-invasive wireless technologies, wireless instrumentation that we just clamp on on top of those gauge readers, temperature, we could just kind of lick and stick type of deal. And so with these technologies, we can all deploy them while running and we can basically you know, run a parallel system. It's, par it's performance monitoring only, so we don't have to worry about interference in, but we can feed the data to operations and have them see it. And also, by the way, with uh, Predix, we did put an edge device at every one of our sites, and so that's basically the gateway to get us into Predix. And so basically, the DAS is connected to the edge, and the edge goes into Predix. So talk a little bit more about this DAS system. So again, it's a distributed antenna system. It's, uh, it's, it's Using the cellular radio communication side, uh, it has a head assembly that you mount in a common area of the site. And basically with an ODU, an optical device, you connect a bunch of remotes. From the remotes, you do antennas. And you're able to connect to the, uh, off the uh, towers. So you can use Verizon, AT&T as a cellular carrier. <clears throat> but the part I like about it the most is this is capabilities of many, many different technologies. And so I, 
built working with Solid and Epri and such. There's a 900 megahertz wireless network that we built. It's an unlicensed um, you know, open frequency network along with the cellular, which is 700. And then we also were able to combine our radio systems along with telex. In nuclear, we like lots of stuff. There's a big difference to us in, in radios and telex is the fact that radio is the one, you know, you talk and then hear. Well, telex, you could talk at the same time. During the uh, refueling outage, they absolutely mandated that they should be able to send and receive at the exact same time while they're doing refueling. So we like lots of technology. And the beautiful about this thing, it was all in the, simple th uh, all in the same technology and the same backbone. Now, this system is capable up to uh, 3 gigahertz, but I intentionally designed this to 900 megahertz and lower. And again, because the lower the, proper, or the lower the frequencies, the better the penetration and the propagation, especially in our stuff, and a lot less antennas. It's a, it's a factor of like two to three to one type of deal. So that cost, it cut my cost down dr drastically. Um, the data rates are not as high, because basically, as everyone knows right now, we're going higher and higher frequencies for higher data. But with you know, 700 megahertz LTE has certainly proven very well. We've been able to get, I think it's uh, about 20, 20 megabits per second throughput for that. Um, we did do a fiber drop on the end and got off the tower for Verizon, and that really helped our speeds and stuff like that. So it's good. Um, like I said, we do have Wi-Fi still in the building, and so we truly need to do the higher data rates on a laptop or so we can do switch to Wi-Fi. <clears throat> okay, so these are the gauges I was talking about. So here's a good example. We have a uh, pneumatic level controller. I know it's Stone Age, and I know the right answer is to, to change it out. But the problem is, is that we have basically like 35 of them all hooked up together, and we're running. So, you know, we can only do it on an outage, and uh, we, the cost of this ended up being about $100,000 per controller to replace it. But we flipped over to these optical electronic eyeballs. You know, we call them wireless gauge readers. Basically, they, they can bolt right onto the face of it and, and change that analog data to digital so, that, so the operators can read it. It also wirelessly transmit on the 900 megahertz frequency all the way back into Predix. Um, when you switch over to this type of clamp-on systems, you've totally jumped through. You, you don't have to deal with design. You don't have to work work management. You don't have to work any of that stuff. And so, yes, you, you know the sensor is about $1,500 each, which is the price of a transmitter, a pressure transmitter. But we can, you know, for for $6,000, we can do level of effort. We can have a maintenance guy go out there and put these things on, and we can get it configured up today. And in nuclear talk, that's impossible. They like to plan and plan and plan. And if we were going to change out this controller to a digital one, that's probably a 24-month lead time and about you know, $100,000 per. And so as you scale this up, this is to, to us a really different, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a price change, it's a culture change that we're able to continue running and be able to, uh, to get our digitally transmit information going on. Again, you know, 100K versus 6K. All right. Okay, so here's our other case study number two, and we're, and we're just getting started. We're probably going to have a lot of them. 2019, I think, is going to be a good year for us. So we have old Mason kneeling controllers and on our feed water level system. They work great, no problems. Every once in a while, one will hiccup, one will lose, you know, needs to be retuned or something like that. So we devised a little plate, an adapter plate, and we're able to put these wireless gauge readers on that. So we, while they're running, no problems, no interference on that, and operations can keep doing the readings. We can put that in there, wireless to transmit into Predix, and basically monitor all these devices and such. Um, it's a huge change. Again, this is, you know, another one is saying switching over to digital uh, positioners for us is about 100 grand per. And uh, time, you know, there's 36 of them. And for us, for this particular unit, it ends up being $8,000 per. So I think it's a good thing. And it's, like I said, it's a much easier way of installing. And so we're able to get things done, what we call level of effort. We can have, you know, people working on a spare time or they're out there, put, install them as they go. Um, benefits, there's tons of them. You know, basically our goal is to add more sensors to basically be able to monitor a lot better. Reducing unplanned downtime. I didn't kind of. I skipped over a little bit, but it was on the slide. You know these um, level gauges. Um, if they do upset, they theoretically could shut us down, and they have in the past, which is millions and millions of dollars. So cost avoidance is a biggie, and being able to optimize the free water heater is a very important thing. And so there's megawatt hours, PM reduction. That was exactly my original task, as I was supposed to reduce PMs. 
and being able to performance monitor things and keep an eye on it is certainly, um, we've had much better success in monitoring things. We find that sometimes when we overthink it, overwork it, and touch it, it ends up being a big old mess. We end up having to go back and rework and do that all the time. So work management, cutback, improvements. Um, with the introduction of, of, of GE Predix, we're able to use the digital twin, safety, and also basically keeping operators out of the reactor area so they, they have dose savings as well. So um, for uh, deployment fleet-wide, this is the beautiful thing about these gauges and a whole lot, you know, temperature and all these other gauges as well. But um, you know, half our sites has got Mason Nealon, the other half has got Fisher. Well, both of them have dial gauges on them. And so it's very easy retro. We can put the gauges on both. It doesn't matter what, what system we have. If you've got a lollipop gauge, you can put them on here. So it's easy to deployable, easy to fleet wide, and we can actually somewhat standardize our, our fleet with that. So in, in closing, um, some of the lessons learned, you know, I, I gave you the rosy picture of how wonderful things are. Um, AWS GovCloud, for us, it was a mandate. We didn't have a choice. But um, as some people explain it to me, you, uh, clouds are a wonderful thing. You've got to think of them as like skyscrapers. There's many different levels, many different doors, many different places you can go in the cloud. When you switch over to a Gov cloud, they close a lot of those doors. And so you have to spend, you have to be very careful on what you open and what you have and how it runs. And so we've struggled with what, you know, what access and what we can do with, well, on the Gov cloud side. Um, we did have problems with Predix. There's been issues. I'm sure a lot of you are aware. One of the things that Pre you know, Predix is a bunch of little software, and they try. They're trying very hard to unify it. You know, they have Meridium, they have Smart Signal, they have all these other things. They all have their own platform, and they're trying to unify it. And that definitely has set them back quite a bit. Um, I did 900 because it, it propagated very nicely. It did a lot better job than the 2.4, but the downside is there's not a lot of sensor selection. But the good side is, is that Exelon's a fairly good sized company. I've been trying to get the other utilities to do this as well. Um, so people are willing to develop sensors in the 900. It's just kind of been moving along very quickly. And the last one I probably made first, and it's my bad type of deal, but remember I told you about the Wi-Fi and the data side. Uh, make sure you pay attention and talk to your IT cybersecurity people first. Um, they will help you. They really do. They do mean it. It's just, you know, if you, you got to work with them because when they, have, when they say no, because they have to say no, you're dead in the water and you got to figure out other ways around it. So um, those are all lessons learned. Um, future plans is, um, you know, we definitely are trying to wrap up our pilot at Nine Mile and we are just, you know, trying very hard to deploy quickly and the other fleet, the rest of the main of the fleet, which is 12 more sites. And uh, we are definitely trying to use different technology, different wireless sensors, and different ways of applying this whole thing. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you.